In this game dev tutorial, you will learn how to create a first person shooter game using Unreal Engine and C++. Fa here teaches this course. He has created a ton of game development tutorials and he is an excellent teacher. What is up guys? Fa here. But you already know that. Do you? <laughs> Anyways, welcome to another Unreal Engine tutorial. This time we have a first person shooter C++ game. Yeah, C++, yeah, 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 yeah game yet. Uh, I have a lot of things to say, but I know you don't want to hear so let's just take a look at the game that you are going to create. So this is the layout of the game. As you can see, we have this huge level, well, huge level. It is a big level. And we have all of these enemies here that are waiting for us where we need to pass by so that we can get all the way through here. And I'm going to speed it up and then here and then here to this door. And this is the end of the game. We, of course, have a timer and we also, you know, have the enemies who are attacking us. So if I preview the game, if I hit the play button, you will see the timer here. I also have my player health at the bottom left and the enemies have their own health. I can shoot the enemies and you can also hear all of that. Look at that. So there you go, shoot. And one more time and the enemy is dead. And this is too loud. So I think, I think I need to, you know, lower the volume just a little bit. There you go. But anyways, this is, you know, basically the game. So we need to pass by here, shoot these enemies. Of course, you will have assignments in this, you know, mini course where you will have to create your own system for having you know a limited number of weapons actually bullets and so on and so forth and the enemies when they get close to me look at that so they are going to deal damage you see and this is too much damage as you can see too much damage i'm going to kill this bad boy come on dingy 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 I don't know what this dingy 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 was, but anyways, this is our game, as you can see, and all of this is created in C++, of course, with combinations with blueprints, but 5% blueprints, because we simply cannot avoid blueprints when you create something in C++, you need to convert that into a blueprint to use it right here in the editor or in your game. But the important part is that we will learn a lot of cool things such as AI perception, which is basically giving your enemies the ability to have sight, hearing and stuff like that. So yeah, that will be it. As you can see, the game looks simple, but we're going to learn a lot of cool and complicated things such as the AI perception and the sight component of it and how to use that in order to detect the player and so on and so forth. So a lot of useful info is inside of this mini course and uh, yeah. I don't have anything else to say except, you know, subscribe, like, and all of that stuff. And uh, let's get into the game and create this really cool game. What up, people? So we are back again with Unreal Engine. And again, this time we are going to, as always, create a game with C++ and Unreal Engine. So this is a new project. As you can see, I have the project browser. And over here, we are going to create a game because we're not a TV producers and architectures and automotive people. So we're going to click here next. And we are going to select the first person. So not blank project, not the puzzle, flying, whatever. We want the first person. And go here. And again, when I say go here, I mean next. And over here we have the blueprint, so we're going to change to C++, everything else can stay the same with starter content because we need it, I need the starter content so badly. And over here I am going to name this one Monster Shooter, there you go, because we shoot monsters, okay, vampires or whatever. And we are going to click here to create a project. Now of course you know that, you know, it's tedious with Unreal Engine and all of that stuff, it takes, you know, probably a year or two for it to load and compile, Unity is getting closer, you know, it takes a lot of time also to create and compile and whatnot. So I am probably going to, you know, cut out the video right here and uh, I will see you back hopefully if this, you know, finishes up until tomorrow. So yeah, let's wait and I will see you when this, you know, the project loads. Finally, Unreal Engine showed mercy and decided to create the project and here we are. Now, of course, before we proceed, because we are going to first cover the player and all of that stuff, we are also going to import our own mesh because over here we have the meshes folder and this is not what we want. Instead, we want this. Let me just go back here, content, and I'm going to right click over here and new folder and create the meshes folder over here. At the top, you see content. And over here, we're going to import our own mesh 
Flesh, which is basically the vampire or the 3D model that we are going to use. Now, you will be able to download it. Link will be down below this video. So just click on the link and it will start downloading. And also you will have a complete project. So this finished project that we are currently doing, you can also download it. This is for reference purposes that you can download, maybe copy and paste some code that you don't want to type out or compare your code to mine and so on and so forth. So I'm going to simply drag and drop the vampire over here. We do need to make sure to import all and wait for the vampire to import. Now, hopefully this is not going to take too long because in the meantime, I can sing to you or whatnot. Don't worry about whatever warning you got. So don't worry about that. Next, I'm going to import his idle animation over here. Import all. And last but not least, I'm going to import the vampire running animation. There you go. Let's go over here and import. And there you go. So now... I am not going to do anything with the monster, with the vampire and whatnot. We are going to do that later on. So don't worry about that. This is just for, you know, saving purposes. So the first step that we are going to do is we are going to create our game character. So we're going to go here inside of our C++ classes and monster shooter. And over here we have the monster shooter character and all of that stuff. We don't want all of this. We simply want to click here, new C++ class that will inherit from the character itself. And I'm going to click on next. And I am going to call this one monster. So monster shooter character. This is the name of our class and I'm going to hit here create class and I have issues when I talk you know as you probably noticed anyways it is not important by the way I have a new blog that is hopefully out I mean the day I'm recording this video the blog is still being made but the day this video will be published the blog will probably be up so you will see a link down below if you like written tutorials you don't want to listen to my voice and whatnot maybe you hate it or whatever so i'm just going to double click this and open it here reload all you can also follow along maybe i will have this tutorial in a written form as well i don't know just you know comment down below if you like written tutorials and if you like me to create more written tutorials on my blog so over here, right below the player setup, player input component, I am going to create a public properties. So the first one is going to be property or U property, and this is going to be visible defaults only. And from here, we're going to say category is equal to mesh. And also, well, over here, closing the parentheses, and I'm going to declare it as a class U skeletal mesh component with a star because it's a pointer and I'm going to call this one hands mesh which is going to be our hands that you know we're going to use to shoot now moving forward I'm also going to copy this over here and we already know what this visible defaults only is what the category is the category will put it under the category mesh when we try to search it inside of the blueprint visible defaults only will make the properties visible of the skeletal default or skeletal mesh component next we are also going to have another skeletal mesh component so I'm simply going to paste all of this here but this time we're not going to call it hands mesh but I'm going to call it guns or gun mesh because, you know, we have hands that, you know, are hands and we also have guns that those hands are holding. So next we are going to have U property, but let me just go over here and copy this so that we don't have to every single time type, time type it out. So we have the visible defaults only category mesh, but this one is going to be class U scene component. There you go. And this one is going to be the muzzle location or basically the, the location from where we are going to shoot. Paste again the U property. And this one is not going to be visible defaults, but this one is going to be visible anywhere. So it's anywhere there you go the category i'm going to say here is equal to camera and i'm also going to make it blueprint so blueprint read only so that we can also read it in the blueprint and over here class you camera it's not convert it's camera component there you go and i'm going to call this one first person camera or fps camera however you want to call it now, next, we're going to have a few more variables for the movement. And over here, I'm going to say U property. And this one is going to be visible anywhere and blueprint. So blueprint read only category is going to be equal to camera. So camera, there you go. Close the parentheses. And this one is going to be our float turn rate. 
I am also going to copy this right here and paste it over here because it's also going to be, or this variable is going to be a U property visible anywhere, blueprint, rent only, category, camera, and instead of turn rate, this is going to be our look up rate. There you go. And we're also going to have the gun offset. And this one is going to be U property. And I'm going to say edit anywhere. And over here, it's going to be blue. So blue print read right and the category is going to be equal to your gameplay like that. And this one is going to be our F vector gun offset. There you go. And we're going to use this gun offset to offset the gun. And we're going to see that. Don't worry. Next, we are going to have protected variables or basically protected functions. The first one is going to be void on fire. This tutorial is on fire there you go I'm also singing so over here we're also going to have void move forward there you go it's forward like that and takes a float value as a parameter we're also going to have void move right and takes a float value as a parameter void turn at rate having a float rate parameter and void look at rate having a float rate parameter. Now you can of course pause the video and copy all of these because these are the default functions that we every single time we need to create because you know it's simple we need we need those in order for you know everything to work. I mean, move forward, move right, look, turn at rate, look at the rate. So over here for the fire, I'm going to right click on it and quick actions and refactoring. And over here, we're going to create that declaration inside of the C++ class, because we know that in the .h file, we only declare things and then we need to implement them inside of the C++ file. So over here, do the same thing for all of these. It will save us time instead of us going out there in the class and typing all of this out. So right quick actions refactoring and there you go so you can now go over here and see that all of these are created so move forward move right look at rate turn at rate and all of that stuff and over here we are first going to have some includes and I'm simply going to paste them so we have the includes for the camera for the capsule and for the input component now what's important for you to you know do is do these includes right away. So don't, you know, don't wait for whatever, just do the includes, pause the video and do that. I have a practice of doing these includes, you know, right when we start with a tutorial or when we start with a certain part of the tutorial so that I don't go back and forth every single time we need a certain component in the code and oh, I need to include this as well. Oh, I forgot to include this. You get the point. So do the includes right here, right now. Otherwise, I will kidnap you and teach you game development. Okay, so moving forward over here inside of the constructor is where we are going to construct everything. So the first step is to get the capsule component and from it, I am going to init capsule size and set the size to 40 F and 95. 0 f this is the default value of the capsule and of course we can change that in the editor but i like to do things you know like this when we do c plus plus goes goes code i don't know about you but i really like typing out code so maybe somebody doesn't like it so there you go so turn rate is going to be equal to 45.0 f there you go look up rate is going to be equal to also 45.0 f now, the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to create the camera component and well, in order to create a camera, we simply need to say first person camera is equal to create default sub object type of view camera component and text over here, which is going to be the name. So inside of text, we're going to give the camera the name first person camera. Simple as that. What do you expect? I'm not going to give it the name Carl. It's not my child. Okay first person camera and from here we're going to say set up attachment and we're going to attach it on the capsule component so get capsule component there you go this is where we are going to attach the first person camera i'm also going to add relative location so first person camera and I'm going to say add relative location and the relative location is going to be f vector 
and the location is going to be minus 39.56 f for the x for the y 1.75 f and last but not least 64 point zero f on the z-axis now relative location if i hover over does it have an explanation no but the relative location is basically location relative to the parent of this component so the first person camera's position will be relative to the get capsule or the capsule component i'm also going to say here first person camera and b use pawn control rotation equal to true we talked about this in our previous videos in I don't I cannot remember exactly which tutorial that was but I demonstrated like when we don't use the pawn control rotation when we use the pawn control rotation so basically this is the this gives the control over the rotation of the pawn so that is it next we are going to create a mesh component that will be used that we are going to view from the first person and that is the hands mesh so hands mesh is going to be equal to create default so default sub object type is going to be used skeletal mesh components so mesh component there you go and over here it's going to have text in the parentheses and for the text over here we're going to say character mesh so moving forward after that, we're going to only make the owner see those hands. What does that mean? That means the following. So hands mesh from here set only owner C. And from there, we are going to set that to be equal to true. This will make only the owner or us having this component see those hands. And this is without this excess, it's only set only owner C. Now, of course, this is not mandatory. It will not change the game at all, but I'm just showing you different options that we have because maybe you're creating a game on your own and you want some of these options. Well, here they are. So next I'm going to call the hands mesh and we're going to set up attachment and we're going to set it up on the first person camera. So this is where we are going to attach these hands on the first person camera that is attached on the capsule component that we already saw. Next, we are going to say hands mesh. And from here, I'm going to say cast dynamic shadow. So cast dynamic shadow is equal to false. This is self-explanatory. It will not cast any dynamic shadows. It will also over here. So hands mesh cast shadow. It's also going to be false because why? We don't need all of this, you know. Again, this is, these are just options that I'm showing you. So next, I'm going to say here, hands mesh, I'm going to add relative low rotation, excuse me. I almost, I wanted to say rotation and location at once, so rotation or something like that. F rotator, and over here, I am going to set the value 1.9F for the X minus 19.19F for the Y and 5.2 for the Z axis. There you go. So this is the relative relative rotation. I'm also going to say hand mesh and add the relative location and this time F vector it's a vector like that and over here I am going to add minus 0.5 F and I added in quotes we don't want to do that in quotes okay next we are going to say minus 4.4 F and minus 55.7 F and there you go so this is the relative location we are almost done we only need to create the gun so gun mesh gun mesh is going to be equal to create default sub object of you skeletal mesh component there you go text over here to give it a name so the name is going to be gun you know like a, I don't know like some hood gangster gun okay so gun mesh from here we're going to say set only owner C here it is true and only the owner will see the gun same as what we did with the hands our gun mesh so it's gun mesh gun mesh there you go cast dynamic shadow is equal to false then our gun mesh from here cast shadow is also going to be equal to false there you go and our muzzle location and gun offset that's the only thing that we need to also create so gun mesh actually the muzzle location not the gun mesh so muzzle location is going to be equal to create default sub object you scene component and text over here and for this one i'm going to say muzzle 
location or basically the location from where the bullet is going to come out our muzzle location set up attachment we're going to attach it on the gun mesh there you go and our muzzle location from here set relative location is going to be f vector so f vector and one more parenthesis so the f vector 0 0.2 f 48.4 f and minus 10.6 f there you go our gun offset is going to be equal to f vector and the value is going to be 100 f for the x 0, 0.0 for the y and 10.0 f for the z-axis now notice over here we did the setup attachment for all these components except for the gun mesh now for the gun mesh we didn't do the for the gun mesh, we didn't do the setup attachment over here inside of the constructor. Instead, we're going to do it here in the begin play. So over here, we're going to say gun mesh and from here attach to component and we're going to attach it to the hands mesh. And we're going to say over here F attachment transform rules. And over here, we're going to say snap to target, not including scale. And last but not least, text. And over here, we are going to say grip point. Now, the reason why I did it in the begin play is because doing it in begin play is safer because the skeletal mesh is not yet created here in the constructor so it can happen that this will not work but when we do in the in the begin play it will work now i will talk about this f attachment transform rules what is this grip point and all of that stuff in the next video because this video is already getting long not what I plan to do, but I just want to compile everything, make sure that we don't have any errors because, you know, I want to make sure that everything that we typed is okay and it's not okay. So I have an, a problem over here on line 40 in the dot H, I'm missing comma in the variable declaration. So let me just quickly go here, 40, okay, here it is. After our blueprint read only, I need to add comma. And, you know, you can forget things because you type too fast, you are a perfect programmer like I am and all that stuff, just kidding. But anyways, you get the point. So this is basically it for this video. In the next video, I will explain what this is. We will create a blueprint out of this. We will continue to code and all of that stuff. If something is not clear, just make sure that you ask in the comment down below. But all of this that we did so far is nothing new. We already know how to create components if you went through any of my tutorials and all of that stuff. So, uh, Yep, uh, Fire here from AwesomeDudes.com. You already know that. You're on the channel, you're on the website or whatever. Make sure to check out the blog and I will see you guys in the next video. What is up my game dev gangster Ronios? In the previous video we stopped over here with the attaching the gun mesh and I said that I will explain what this is. So basically what does this mean is that we are going to attach the gun mesh on the hands mesh and these are the rules that we are going to use for that attachment. So snap to the target not including scale. So the scale is not is going to be untouched for the gun. So if we set the scale 100 by 100 for the gun it's not going to be touched no matter what the scale of the hands mesh is. Now what is this grip point well basically the grip point is where we are going to attach the gun mesh on the hands mesh what does that even mean well that means if I go over here and this is where the hands are located so in the first person folder character and then mesh and these are the hands so if I double click these hands we are going to open them right here now if we go into the skeleton of these hands you will notice over here that we have something called a grip point look at that so this is that grip point and if I come closer to the hands where the grip point is, you see, this is where it is going to be attached. Now, in one of my previous tutorials, I have shown you how we can create our own custom snapping socket name or whatever. Basically, you just, you know, choose where you want to create it. Then you right click and then you add a socket and you give it a name. The name is important because here in the code, you're going to reference that name so that you attach your desired component on that on that socket so this is what we are doing and this is where this grip point is so this is where the weapon or the gun mesh is going to be attached now in order for us to demonstrate that we do need to 
create a blueprint. So over here inside of the content, we can right click and create a new folder for blueprints. And for this bad boy, I'm going to go inside, create a blueprint class that is going to inherit. So over here, all classes, we are going to say monster shooter character. So this is the one that we are going to inherit. And I'm going to say BP underscore monster shooter character. There you go and double click this bad boy open him you know in visual studio i in visual studio in the editor not the visual studio so we need to open him in the editor so over here there you go so we have the character mesh this is the mesh the the, the one that comes by default these are our hands that we are going to use and attach so basically over here for our hands i am going to choose the hands so let me just find them mannequin hands or arms here they are this is what we want now i'm also going to attach the I'm going to attach the blueprint for the animation for these and this is going to be first person anim there you go which is automatically going to position them right here as you can see now when it comes to the gun we also need to go over here let me just compile and save that so go over here for the gun and we need to search the gun so let me just find it here is the gunny gunny and you know compile and save that so there you go so this is where my gun is going to be and i believe the gun should be a little bit more behind i think i'm not sure 100 percent, but let's go over here inside of our map and what i'm going to do also here in the c plus plus class i'm going to right click and create a new c plus plus class and click here to show all, cl all classes and filter for the game mode and I want to inherit from the game mode, not the game mode base, but the game mode. And I'm going to click here next and I'm going to call this one monster shooter game mode. Simple as that or monster shooter underscore game mode. This I'm going to call monster shooter game mode. And I am going to click here, create class, which is of course going to do, you know, all of the heavy lifting and whatnot and yada, yada, yada. You get the point and all of that stuff. So let us just wait for it and I can sing to you all this time. Yada 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 na, 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 na. reload everything. Now the reason why I have, you know, the reason why I created our own game mode is because we need to create a blueprint out of it. So let's go here into the blueprints and right click blueprint class and filter for my monster shooter game mode here it is and i'm going to say bp underscore monster shooter underscore game mode so that we can go here inside of our project settings and then maps and modes and change the default game mode to our own so bp monster shooter game mode so that we can also change the default pawn class to our bp monster shooter character now the reason for that is now when we hit the play button to actually run the game our game character is going to be the one that's going to be spawned but let me just click on this character over here for whatever reason where is the character so first person character here he is i can delete this we don't need him over here i can have this one over here for spawning the character this is the start of the character right so yeah basically as i said when we run the game our own character is going to be spawned and we can test that out by hitting the play button and there you go so if i eject myself we are going to see that we have spawned the character look at that he is being spawned and look at where his where the weapon is being spawned it's right in the socket that i showed you a moment ago so let me just find it it was in the first person not ppp fps actually blue let me just go here in the content and then first person and then fps weapon and then meshes and here it is actually this is the gun you know i forget where this is so excuse me for that one so it's first person and character and then mesh and here it is finally finally i know where it is and when we go into skeleton again having the grip point if i zoom in on the grip point and i press the f to go directly to the grip point you see it's in the hand and if i go here in the map Voila, there you go. He is already spawned here 
in the map. So this video is more about explaining what, you know, is happening and all of that stuff. So in the next video, we're going to start to code the movement of our character. Then we're going to start creating the level and all of that part or that stuff and yada, yada, yada. If something was not clear when it comes to this video and the explanations that we did and what is, you know, a socket and all of that stuff, just make sure you ask in the comment down below. And I will see you guys in the next video. Where else am I going to see you? I'm going to see you in jail. Because, you know, I, I, I don't go to jail. You go. And, uh, yeah. So we cannot see each other. I will see you in the next video. Alrighty then, my game dev gangsta Roni O. Now we are going to create the movement for the player. Because even if I hit the play button, try to move, nothing is happening. You get the point. So we are going to go into the project settings in here for the input. We have everything already predefined. But we don't need all of this. So over here, I am going to have jump and fire, but reset VR, no, no, I don't need that. So over here for the fire, I'm also going to remove all of this here. We only need the left mouse button, nothing else. For the jump, we also need the space, nothing else. So all of this right here can be safely deleted. We are going to have move forward, but for the move forward, we're going to have WS up and down. All of these others, you know, we don't need them. Why should we? For the move right, we need the A and the D. That's all. So let's go over here. Remove all of this. Remove, remove. For the turn and turn rate. So basically this over here, we don't need the turn rate like this. So we can simply delete it. Here we have the look up rate and the look up. So look up rate, I'm also going to delete. We need the turn and look up. So the turn has the mouse X and the look up has the mouse Y. And all of this right here, this is what we need. Of course, I can also delete the up and down or add here left and right arrow key. That is totally up to you. But what is the next step is to go inside of our script, inside of our CPP and over here, set up player attachment. So set up player input component basically to bind the functionality to input. So what we need to do over here is we need to call the player input component. So component component like that and we are going to bind the action jump is the first one that we're going to do ie pressed so when we press the jump button inside of this i am going to call let me just see over here i almost tried to search for the jump functionality but we have the a character that colon colon i almost said dash jump there you go so this is already built into our character and can copy this and paste it here so now i'm going to do that for the e do that do it for the e released and over here i'm going to say stop jumping so when you release the button we are going to stop the jumping simple as that next i'm also going to take our player input component and bind the action and the action is going to be over here fire so fire this section is on fire anyways when we press the i when ie is pressed inside of this we want to call the fire functionality which is this one over here we're not going to code it right now but as i said when we go through things that we want to do i don't want to you know just skip this and then later on when we actually want to shoot i come back oh we also need to buy the component no I might forget and stuff like that. So I'm going to do it right now. You can do some UE log, for example, just to print out to see if this actually works, but we know that it is going to work. I'm also going to take the player input component and we are going to bind, uh, bind the axes. So bind the axes and this time it's going to be move forward the axes inside of this. And we're going to set here our move forward. So simply copy this here and add the and sign, and there you go. Next, I'm going to copy this and paste it down below because this time we have the move right. So move right and also calling the move right function. Last but not least, we have two more. So I'm simply going to copy these and paste them over here. So one is going to be the turn, the other one is going to be look up. There you go. And over here, we are going to call the turn at rate. And over here, we're going to call look at rate. Simple as that. So this is how we bind. And this is not the first time that we're doing this. So we already know how to do it. Now here inside of move forward, we are going to test if the value, which is this parameter over here. So if the value is not equal to 
0.0f meaning we are actually pressing the button then we are going to say add movement input and we are going to say over here get actor forward vector and comma here and pass the value so that we know where we are going you can assume what we're going to do for the move right the same thing so copy over here but this time we're not going to say get actor forward vector instead over here we're going to say get actor right vector because we're, we are always right now over here we are going to calculate delta for the frame of the turn so what we are going to do over here is we are going to say add controller yaw input and we are going to use the rate that is the parameter over here so using the rate multiplied with the turn rate and then we're going to multiply that with the get world and from the world we're going to get the delta seconds like this and as I said, this is going to calculate the delta for this frame from the rate information, which is going to make it a little bit smoother. And going back over here, pacing this, the look rate, but this time it's not going to be add controller yaw input, it's going to be the pitch input. So over here, I'm going to say pitch input. And again, we are going to use the rate over here, the parameter, but this time it's not the turn rate it's the look up rate that we are going to use and multiply that with the world and delta second so control shift b to compile all of this and make sure that we didn't do any oopsies which is the case there you go let me just turn off my volume because i don't want you to hear this it's embarrassing and whatnot just kidding but you get the point so over here we bound the functionality we know already what this is and in case some beginner is watching this what is this jump what is this fire this move forward well it's basically this functionality over here so this is the jump this is the fire move forward move right turn and all of that stuff so we are binding these functions to those you know to those axes and inputs which means when we press the space bar you see over here for the jump or let's do it for the move forward so when we press the w or s key then we are going to execute the move forward the move forward function which is this one right here and we can go inside of our editor and we can test it out so if i hit the play button you see i can rotate now look up and down and i can move forward look at that i can also jump you see i have i'm jumping look at that jumpy 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 you get the point i'm jumping so there you go so look or we can turn we can look up we can look down i can move backwards forward left and right and there you go so basically, this is how easy it is to set up the moon. This is for you who are beginners and watching this. And I know this is not a complete beginner tutorial, but I cannot prevent beginners from watching it for whatever reason. You know, I cannot put some wall, internet wall that doesn't allow you to do that, but you get the point. Anyways, if something is not clear, what we did over here, as I said and already explained, so we only bound the axes that we have over here inside of our project settings so move forward that is the name if here the name is movement so if we change from move forward to movement over here we will also change from move forward to movement so those names need to match up and then over here this is just the function that is bound to that axis or action that's all there is to it so when we press the appropriate buttons that we have designated for move forward move right turn look up these appropriate functions that are bound to those axes or actions will execute will execute so there you go if something is not clear ask in the comment down below i will not help you out i will just ignore your comment i'm just kidding i will try to help you out as best as i can and i will see you guys in the next video moving forward now that we have our character and he is moving let us create the projectile before we can start shooting and in order for us to do that we need to go over here inside of our c++ files and all that stuff so we are going to right click and go here new c++ class that is going to inherit from the actor and from there we're going to click on next and from here instead of my actor i'm simply going to call it projectile and this is going to be the projectile you can also call it bullet or however you want to call it okay that is up to you 
you can call it Carl, Kenny, I don't know. But anyways, I'm going to call it projectile. So let me just lower my volume so that we don't hear all of those noises when, you know, something has compiled and all of that stuff. Let's go over here, reload everything inside of our CPP file or actually in the Visual Studio and right here below our tick. So this is where we are going to create our own properties and we are going to create a U property and this one is going to be visible defaults only. And from there, we are also going to set it into the category, which is going to be equal to projectile. And this is again, when you want to locate it inside of a blueprint, you can find it under the projectile category. So over here, I'm going to say class U sphere component. And from there, I'm going to call it collision sphere, which is going to, and it's not CP, it's collision sphere. And this one is going to be the sphere that we are going to use to detect collision with the player and, and other components in the game. So next we have the U property and this one is going to be visible anywhere and this one's going to be blueprint read only and it's going to be category equal to movement and this one is going to be class u projectile movement component so we are going to use the projectile movement component to propel the projectile to move and i'm going to call it projectile movement there you go Next, we are going to create a U function and this one is going to be our detection for the hit and over here I'm going to call it void on hit and it takes a lot of these parameters as you already know, so U primitive component which is a pointer hit component it also takes an actor which is you know also a pointer other actor that we are going to test if we you know hit or who is the other actor that we hit you primitive component which also is a pointer other component and then int 32 other body index and bool b from sweep and last but not least constant f hit result which we are going to call hit now of course we don't need all of these parameters but they are mandatory for us to well create or to declare this function so we need to do it and also the last step we are going to have a u property not proper two it's property and this one is going to be edit anywhere and it's going to be a float damage value by default it is going to be equal to 20. now this damage value is going to be the damage that we are going to deal to the enemy when we hit it and over here i'm going to go and click on so right click on on hit and from here create declaration inside of the c plus plus file so over here inside of the c plus plus automatically this will be created so we don't have to you know type this out on our own now when it comes to the cpp file we know that over here we are going to implement everything so right below i am going to include everything that we need to include i'm also going to include over here so i'm going to say include and this one is going to be enemy.h now we still didn't create the enemy so i am going to simply comment this out otherwise we will have issues but i'm going to leave it there so that later on when we actually create the enemy we know that we need to include it because again i don't like to go back and forth every single time oh we created the enemy let's go and include it and all of that stuff so over here inside of the constructor for the projectile, we are going to say our collision. So collision sphere is going to be equal to create default sub object of you sphere component and that sphere component. We are going to give it a name with a text over here. So the name is going to be sphere collision. And the sphere component, we are going to set the initial radius to 20. So I'm going to say collision sphere sphere and from here in it radius or in its sphere radius we are going to set that to 20 as i already said it's 20 f not 20 point f zero i'm also going to set the sphere to be the root component so i'm going to say root component is equal to the collision sphere there you go which is going to set the sphere as the root of all other components that we are going to add to the projectile now for the projectile movement, so projectile movement is going to be equal to 
create default sub object of you projectile movement and from there give it a text or basically a name which is inside of a text and I'm going to call it projectile movement now right here below over here I'm going to say projectile movement and we are going to say update it component is going to be equal to collision sphere or basically what does this mean so it's collision sphere not let me just take it from here and copy and paste it so the updated component basically means who is the projectile movement moving so who is he moving he's moving the collision sphere which is the root component which is going to move all other components that are below it also over here our projectile movement we are going to set initial speed to be equal to 3000 because we want our projectile to be fast as a you know something that's fast projectile movement from here max speed is also going to be equal to 3000 because this is power level over 2000 it's not over 3000 because it is you know you get the point projectile movement we are going to say b rotation follows velocity is going to be equal to true so rotation follows velocity this is self-explanatory the projectile will rotate according to the velocity and our projectile movement from here we're going to say b should bounce is going to be equal to true so we are going to be able to bounce now i'm also going to set the initial lifespan of the projectile which is going to be here so initial life span that's going to be equal to three seconds which means if we don't hit anything after three seconds the projectile will be destroyed simply after three seconds <laughs> that's all there is to it now over here inside of begin play this is where we need to connect so our collision sphere and from here we need to say on component begin overlap add dynamic and over here is where we are going to connect this function so i'm simply going to copy it and from here i'm going to say this and then and sign and paste the function that we want to provide over here so again we need to do this in on begin play because if we do it inside of the constructor it is not going to work if i don't forget when we create the enemy i will test it out by simply you know just to demonstrate what happens if we call it inside of the constructor as opposed to what happens when we call it in on begin play but we also did this numerous of times in my other tutorial so it's not something new that we didn't do so far so Control shift b for this to compile so let us just wait for this to compile let's see if i have any oopsies and i don't so build one succeeded there you go so what i'm going to do now is go and create a blueprint from this because in the next video we are going to start to shoot it so inside of blueprints i'm going to right click and blueprint class and i'm going to filter for projectile and here it is and from there i'm going to say bp projectile and go inside of the blueprint so that we can you know add everything what we need are we in the viewport yes we are what i'm doing so i'm in the viewport so here we have the collision sphere what i'm also going to do is attach the I'm going to attach a static mesh component so over here i'm going to say static mesh there you go it's simple as that and this is going to be our projectile mesh now of course i can also create this from the blueprint but you know actually from the code but i'm also going to demonstrate how you're going to mix blueprints and code because this is what happens all the time with unreal engine so you need to mix blueprints and code it's simple as that now over here for the static mesh i'm going to filter for projectile first person projectile it's a huge sphere so over here i'm going to click on the lock icon and set the scale for or th for all three axes to point one point one and point one so there you go now this is it when it comes to creating the projectile we still cannot test it out because i don't want to make this video too big and stuff like that it's already 10 minutes and so on and so forth so starting from the next video we are going to see how this projectile is going to work how we are going to propel it and all of that stuff but if something is not clear when it comes to creating the projectile just make sure that you ask in the comment down below now all of this here that we did it's nothing new maybe the projectile movement but you can you know just read from the functions or what we did they are self-explanatory but again if something is not clear make sure that you ask and i will also help you out in the next video we're going to start shooting the projectile i will see you guys then
Now that we have the projectile, we can put it or add it to the monster character and use it for our shooting. So over here inside of our .h file, right after we create all of this look at rate and all of this stuff, we are going to create new variables and they are going to be public. So one is going to be your property and this one is going to be edit defaults only. And I'm going to say category is equal to not category, category is equal to projectile. Now, what I'm also going to do, or how am I going to declare this? This is going to be RT subclass, so subclass, not sub case, subclass of. And over here, I'm going to say class A projectile, and I'm going to call it projectile, simple as that. And it's with one R, and they are both lowercase, or basically one R, and it's lowercase, not both. So moving forward, we are also going to add the sound that we are going to play when we shoot. So over here, I'm going to say your property, and this one is going to be edit anywhere, and I'm going to call it or set here blueprint read write. I'm also going to set the category to be equal to gameplay, and this one is going to be our class U sound base, which we are going to call fire sound or shoot sound or however you want to call it. And moving forward, we are going to create another U property. And this one is going to be edit anywhere, blueprint, read, write. So blueprint, read, write. Category, so category is going to be equal to gameplay. And this one is going to be our class U anim montage, which is a pointer. And we are going to call it fire animation, which is basically the animation that we are going to use to preview when we shoot. So when we shoot, this is the animation that's going to be played. Now over here, we're going to say class U anim instance, which is a pointer and I'm going to call anim instance. This is what I'm going to call it. Next, we are going to have a class U world and I'm going to call it world and it's a pointer. So not the parenthesis world like that. F rotator spawn rotation for the projectile and f vector this is going to be the spawn location for the projectile so these are the variables that we currently need now over here inside of our monster.cpp at the top we are going to add the includes so you can just pause the game and add all the includes as I already said and mentioned, I do this so that we, you know, don't have to do it over and over again or every single time we basically, every single time we add something new, I don't have to go back, oh, include this, include that. So include the projectile animation, anime instance, kiss mode, gameplay, static, statics, and the monster shooter game mode. I'm going to control shift B just to compile this, see if I, you know, made a typo anywhere, but I'm also going to attach the shooting sound and I'm also going to attach the projectile and I'm going to attach the montage or the animation. Now, for whatever reason, it is taking a little bit too long for this to compile. So I'm simply going to wait or now. Okay, now it is compiling. Okay, there you go. It, it has compiled. So let's go back here inside of our first person shooter or monster character. Here he is. Open the blueprint and click on the top object over here. You see the top one, this one, so that now over here we are going to have the fire sound, the fire animation and the projectile. So the fire sound is going to be weapon fire. So weapon fire 2. This is the fire sound. The fire animation is going to be again fire and over here first person fire montage and the projectile over here is going to be the BP projectile simple as that so compile and save that so now we can go back inside of our script and do you know the rest what we need to do now inside of begin play where we are is where we are going to get some references so we're going to say world is going to be equal to get world so we're going to get that we are also going to say our anim instance and we're going to get that from the hands mesh so our hands mesh and from there we're going to say get anim instance there you go so this is the anim instance that we are going to get and did we add the anim instance yes anim instance why is this in 
instance. Okay, I didn't type it correctly. So anim instance. There you go. So now inside of our on fire, this is where we are going to do the fire. Whatever. I, I wanted to sing like that, you know, whatever. It's not important. Anyways, we're going to test if the world is not equal to null. So if we have the world, because the world is important to us, you are my world, I'm your world, and we are important to each other. So next over here, I'm going to say spawn rotation is going to be equal to get control rotation. And this is going to be the control rotation from the pawn character or our own character. Now, why am I testing if the world is not equal to null? Just so that we have a reference to the world, because the world is the one who is going to spawn the projectile so we need to have the world if we don't have it we will not spawn the projectile our spawn location is going to be equal to and over here we're going to perform some tests so first we're going to say if our muzzle so if the muzzle location is not equal to null ptr and this is what we are testing and if if this allows me to test it out. So I believe this was, okay, there you go. So null PTR, if muzzle location is not equal to null PTR with a question mark, we're asking this, then we're going to say over here, muzzle location. From there, we're going to say get component location. Otherwise, call on over here, we're going to say get actor location. And there you go, plus the spawn rotation dot rotate vector and we're going to rotate by the gun offset and there you go and why is this giving me if muzzle location not equal to null ptr so it's null ptr there you go why is why was it giving me weird Anyways, over here, we're testing or we're setting the spawn location to be equal to. We're first testing if the muzzle location is not equal to null pointer, meaning we have the muzzle location, we have created it because I told you we are going to use the muzzle location to shoot. So that is the location from where the from where the projectile is going to fire. So that's why we need it. So if it's not equal to null pointer, then we are going to get the location of the muzzle. So if it's not equal to pointer, but this is just in case if we forget, for example, or this is a way to secure your code, let's say like that, so that you make it error proof. So if it is, so with the question mark, essentially what we're asking is this. So we're asking if the muzzle location if it's not equal to null PTR like that, then over here, we're going to do this. We're going to say our spawn location. So spawn location is equal to, and we're going to get that from the muzzle location. Else, so else over here, if that is not the case, so the muzzle location is equal to null PTR, then we're saying this, spawn location is equal to all of this. So essentially this line of code, so from here, up to here is equal to all of this. So this is how you do it. I don't believe this is called a ternary operator. I, I don't, you know, I forget the names and I don't even bother to remember these names because the important thing is that you know what it is. Maybe for a job interview, you should know what it is. If they ask you, oh, what is a ternary operator? You should know the ternary operator is this. But for your own development, you just need to know how to use it. So don't bother that much. My advice, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not, comment down below what you think, but anyways, you denote it with a question mark. So you have a condition, then you add a question mark, and after that is the first condition. So if it's true, this will be executed. Call on, if it's not true, then this will be executed. So again, this right here is equivalent to this right here. So this is what we are doing. Now, moving forward, we are going to set spawn collision handling override. So over here, I'm going to say F actor spawn parameters, and I'm going to call it actor spawn params. And I'm going to say actor spawn params is or dot spawn collision handling override is going to be equal to e spawn actor collision handling method colon colon adjust possible but don't spawn if colliding. What the hell is this teacher? You are confusing me. I don't know what it is. Well, don't, you know, just calm down. I'm going to explain. So this F actor spawn parameters defines available strategies for handling the case where an actor is spawned 
in such a way that it penetrates blocking collision. Basically, when there is a danger that when you spawn an actor that it will collide right away with something at that point where you are going to spawn it, well, this defines how you're going to or how that actor is going to handle that collision. Now, this adjust if possible, but don't spawn if colliding. This means that the actor will try to find a nearby non-colliding location based on the shape component, of course. So it's going to try to find a nearby non-colliding location, but will not spawn unless one is found. So if it, you know, if it sees that something is there and it can collide with it, it will not spawn. It will try to find nearly, so near it, something, you know, some location where it will not collide. And then it will spawn there. Essentially, this is what we are doing. And last but not least, we are simply going to say over here world spawn actor and the actor that we are going to spawn from here, we are going to say a projectile. This is the actor that we are going to spawn and who are we going to use as a reference? Well, our own projectile that we attached in the beginning of this video at the spawn location using the spawn rotation and actor spawn params and there you go so that's why we need to know if the world is not equal to null so that we can use it to spawn the projectile and i can control shift b just to make sure that i didn't do any oopsies you see the build has succeeded now i'm not sure if the sound is going to be heard because you know i have the mic at the low input volume or low input level which means i have my mic near my mouth so this is why the sound is now crispy you know and this is me bragging but anyways that is the reason why we cannot hear the the shooting but i will hope that it will be heard from the desktop because i'm recording desk desktop and audio at the same time anyways moving forward let's go here and test it out so if i go here in the first person example map there you go look at that so we are shooting and it is shooting, but we are not animating and displaying the sounds. So there you go. We are shooting and doing all of that stuff. There you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. We can, you see, destroy everything and it is working. Yada, 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 yada. But we don't have the shooting sound and that's and the animation. So we need to go here right below and we need to test. So basically outside of R, so outside of this over here. So outside of the if statement for testing, but we can actually do it inside because it makes more sense to do it inside. We're going to test if our fire sound is not equal to null, meaning we have attached our fire sound. So we're going to call you game play statics. So game play statics, hopefully it will, you know, give it to me. There you go. Play sound at location. There you go. This and the fire sound is the one that we are going to play at the get actor location. There you go. So it's a good idea to actually call the code to play the sound if you want the sound to be played. And over here, if our fire animation is not equal to null and our anim instance is not equal to null, then we are going to call the anim instance from here to montage play so montage montage underscore play not player and it's montage what is it with me montage underscore play there you go passing the fire animation and 1.0 f which is the playback rate so if you hover over that's the in play rate basically we're going to play the animation from the beginning this is what it means so control shift b and make sure that this compiles and let me just lower my volume because i think it is too loud well not it's a 30 but i think you will hear it if not you will hear it guaranteed on your own computer but i will try to you know at least get the audio from the desktop there we go you can hear that we are shooting and you can also see hit all of these here now of course let me just go and you know lower the volume just a little bit so that we can actually hear what you know i'm talking there you go so we're shooting we can shoot projectiles and all of that stuff so this is how you can use the same code for your own game to shoot the projectiles and yada 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 if something is not clear when it comes to this video for the code that we did over here for everything that we typed out just make sure that you ask in the comment down below spawn rotation we get it from the control rotation i explained this over here with a very cool visual example by using if else statements 
I've explained the actor parameters using the world to spawn the projectile over here if we have the sound and the animation just play them and that would be it anyways ask down below suddenly is not clear I will help you out and I will see you guys in the next video what is up people so now we are going to create our enemy because we already have the player he's shooting so let's go over here in the c++ and c++ section or folder and create a new class that will inherit from the character and from here i'm simply going to call it enemy very clever very creative i'm the most creative person in the whole world i'm just going to lower my volume or basically mute my computer so that we you know don't get some i don't know how's it called hearing disability hearing uh, problems whatever because my you know speakers destroyed your ears we don't want that okay we want you to follow the tutorial so let's go over here and double click the enemy open it inside of our visual studio and reload everything and yada 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 so in this video i'm just going to prepare the basic stuff such as the animation and some components so over here after we create our setup player input component we are going to create a new property and this one is going to be edit anywhere so anywhere and it's going to be class u box component which is a pointer and this is going to be our damage collision which is basically going to be the component that we are going to use to detect damage dealt to the player so when the player collides with this component we will deal damage to him over here i'm just going to paste this function you can go and basically copy and paste it from the player himself so you can go here inside of the monster shooter character dot h and you can where is it monster shooter character where do I actually it's in the projectile so in the projectile you can just copy this and you can go over here and you can paste it and from here I'm going to quick actions and refactoring create the you know declaration and whatnot so it is going to create it hopefully did it create it or did it block there you go it blocked for a second but it also created it so over here at the top we are going to have a few includes we are going to have more includes later on don't worry about that so over here we have the box component and monster shooter character we will need that to detect if we have collided with the monster shooter character so what's gonna happen inside of our constructor we're going to say damage collision is going to be equal to create default so it's default not defy default i need to do it again so create default default sub object and it's going to be a u box component and we are going to give it a name here inside of a text the name is going to be damage collision voila there you go we are going to set it up or attach it on the root component so set up attachment on the root component that would be pretty much it and inside of our begin play we are going to bind the function to the on component begin overlap so damage collision on component begin overlap that add dynamic dynamic there you go this and the name of the function which is going to be our a enemy on hit of course adding the and sign and there you go now we can control shift b to compile this because now we are going to go inside of our editor and create a blueprint for it so the build has succeeded let's go in the editor and inside of our blueprints we are going to right click and go blueprint class that's going to inherit the enemy class and this one is simply going to be bp enemy very simple we did this numerous of times and this is the damage collision that we already have so what i'm going to do with the damage collision is i'm going to set the x to 41 that is the position of it and over here i'm going to set the box extent on the y to 60 and on the z to 112 so 102 also for our mesh we are going to select over here our character or the vampire there you go he is translucent or transparent not translucent let me just first do this so on the z-axis i'm going to say minus 85 and rotate him minus 90 degrees and this is how the character is going to well look like when it comes to the capsule component we are going to leave as is compile and save and why is he you know why can we see through him well because he's a vampire first things first and the second is if we go here in the meshes and let me just find the material vampire mat this is what we need so this material and we need to click on this mat over here and this is not the first time we are doing this so over here for the material we have this blend mode which is currently set to translucent we need to set it to masked 
and apply that and save it. When we do that, it will change the appearance of that material. I don't know that much about materials and what is going on here, but basically when we do this now, we have the we have the vampire visible. So I can research a little bit more and explain that in a separate video if you want me to, but you can also, I encourage you to research that on your own because that's the best way to learn. Now over here, I'm going to inside of the meshes. So in the mesher, I'm thinking about creating a separate folder. Yeah, separate folder, new folder, and I'm going to call it enemy or simply, yeah, enemy animations. So enemy animations, because we are only going to have enemy animations. So why not put it in a separate folder, right click over here and we're going to go under animation and we are going to use blend space 1D and select the vampire skeleton. And this one is going to be our vampire idle underscore running. There you go. So let's go inside and drag the idle animation over here. This is not the first time we're doing this, by the way, and drag the running animation here. I'm going to change here the, the horizontal axis name to speed, not spe, it's speed, and the maximum value can be 375. So now, for example, if it's over here, the value, then he is in the idle, if it's over here, he is running, you get the point. So this is not the first time that we are doing this, as I already mentioned. So yeah, that would be it. We can also go now inside here and create an animation blueprint. So this is what we want and it will take the vampire skeleton. Okay, and this is going to be our BP, enemy, so enemy underscore animation. And for this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a variable and that one is going to be the speed variable, which is going to be a float. There you go, compile and save that. I'm also going to right click over here and create a state machine. So state machine this is going to be my new state machine. And I'm going to call this state machine vampire movement. We can also call it simply movement that can do. I'm going to plug this in, even though we don't have anything, but we can go over here. And now we can right click and create a new state. This is going to be idle underscore walk or uh, basically backslash walk or underscore or what's with me and the underscore idle walk or idle running. This is what I wanted to say this whole time. So going back over here for the result, I'm going to use the idle running, which is our blend space 1D, plug it in over here and plug in the speed over here. Now the speed variable, we are going to change that. So I'm going to compile and save that so that now automatically we see that the vampire has changed his state from the T pose to the animation pose. But we are later on when we add or later on in the next video, when we start to add more variables to our enemy, we are going to code the speed movement inside of our event graph over here. So we're going to do that. And we're going to get that from the script, we're going to see all that don't worry about it. Just over here for the enemy and the mesh character for the anim class, we're going to search for the BP enemy animation. So that now if I compile and save and take the enemy, so I need to find his blueprint, which is inside of the blueprints and enemy and there you go. So now we have the enemy who is right here, I can move a little bit down, just take this here, the snap sizes, something like this. And there you go. So if I hit the play button, we will see the enemy who is behind us and he is being animated. Of course, he is not doing anything to us because he's not detecting us. He's not doing, you know, yada, 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 whatnot. We're going to start to code that from the next video, add his AI site so that he can see us and then run towards us and all of that stuff. If something was not clear when it comes to this video, make sure that you're asking the comment down below, but basic things over here, just creating the damage collision over here, also adding or binding the function to the on component begin overlap and then creating the animations. It's not the first time if you followed any of my Unreal Engine tutorials, I covered this a lot. So yeah, but of course, if something's not clear, ask, I will answer, I will see you in the next video. What it up guys, in the previous video we created the enemy, this is the enemy, look at the enemy, this is the enemy, and we created his animation. So now we can continue coding the enemy to add some AI functionality. Now so far in a lot of the videos that I did when it comes to the enemy AI, I have used 
these colliders, like a sphere colli collider or a box collider or collision, that is, so that we can detect when the player gets or touches that collider, then we know that the player is close, we can attack him and so on and so forth. But this time I'm going to use UI perception component, which is going to allow the enemy to simulate senses such as sight and hearing and so on and so forth. So let's go here inside of our enemy.h file and right here below this, right here you function on it and yada 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 we are going to add all the components that we need but before we do that we do need to go over here inside of our dot build file here it is monster shooter dot build file so this is the one that we want so it's under source over here and then monster shooter like that you need to find the dot build file for your project and over here inside of this public dependency module names Click here, enter to separate them on the second line and over here after the last one that you have, so my is head mounted display, you're going to add comma and then you are going to paste here this AI module. So paste it like this, if you don't do it, it will not work no matter what other code we put in. So you need to in quotes paste this AI module. So now that we have that out of the way, we can go back over here inside of the enemy.h file and I can start typing. So first I want to add the U property and this one is going to be visible. So it's visible defaults only. And this one is going to be category enemy. There you go. And this one is going to be class U AI perception component, which is a pointer and I'm going to call it AI per comp. There you go. So what the hell is this teacher? What is this UI perception component? Well, UI perception component is used, as I said, to implement senses for an actor. For example, sight so that it can see or hear so that it can hear and that kind of stuff. So this is used as an AI component. So next we are going to create another UI property or U property, not UI, but U property. We're going to have it visible defaults only category enemy. This one is going to be class UAI sense config underscore site, which is a pointer. And I'm going to call it site config. It's con fig there you go so what is this uai sense config site whatever well this config is used to configure the ai perception component for sight detection so this particular one is used to configure the sight detection for the uai perception component next we are going to create a u function so you function like that and this one is going to be void unsensed and it takes a constant t array of actor so a actor which is a pointer by the way and over here close the curly bracket and have here and sign update actors this or updated not update excuse me updated actors this is a function that will inform us if any actors are detected by the UAI perception component or by AI perception component. So this is the one and I'm going to go here, quick actions and refactoring, create the definition inside of our .cpp file so that, you know, yada, 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 we don't have to go and type it out ourselves. So next, what do we need for our functionality? Well, next we need U property. And over here, this one is going to be visible, so visible anywhere. And the category, so category is going to be movement. And for this one, I'm going to call F or we're going to declare F rotator and enemy rotation is the name for the F rotator. Next, I'm going to just copy this over here because we're going to do the exact same thing. But this time we're going to have an F vector and this one is going to be our base location because the F enemy is going to be able to go and try to attack the player but if he doesn't find the player then he is going to go back to the base location basically when he detects the player he will run towards him when the player runs away from his sight then he is going to go back to his to his location this is essentially what we are doing 
So this is for the base location. Next, we are going to have another U property. So I'm just going to copy this and paste it over here. So we're going to have another visible anywhere, but this one, we're also going to use it as a blueprint read only. We will see why. Basically, I can tell you right now for the animation and we will see how this is going to work. F vector, and this one is going to be the current velocity of the movement. So the current velocity of the enemy. Another U property that is going to be visible anywhere category is going to be equal to movement. This is going to be float movement speed, self-explanatory for what we are going to use it. Another function that we are going to have is avoid set new rotation, which takes an F vector target position and an F vector current so current position as two parameters to determine the new rotation we're also going to have a boolean back to base location to determine if we should go back to the base location or not another f vector which is going to be our new location to determine what is the new location where we should move to and our float distance so distance squared there you go Another over here, U property, so pro property, there you go, which is going to be edit anywhere, not anywhere, but anywhere. And this is going to be blueprint, so blueprint read only. This one is going to be our health, so float health, which is going to be equal to 100.0F. And last but not least, we are also going to have another U property. I'm going to copy this over here, paste it over here. This is edit anywhere. This is going to be float damage value. By default, it's going to be equal to 5F. And last but not least, we are going to have a public function. And this one is going to be void deal damage so that we can deal damage to the player. Float damage amount as the parameter. Or basically not to deal damage to the player. This is for us to be dealt with damage. So the enemy will be dealt with the damage. And over here we have the damage amount parameter. Don't worry about these right now because we will, you know, code them later on, use them later on. For the moment, what did I type? What did I click over here? Cancel, cancel. Okay, there you go. So quick actions and refactoring, create. There you go. And last but not least for the deal damage as well, quick actions, refactoring, create, you know, signature, whatnot, and hopefully come on, hurry it up and it will create the definition for us. I don't know why is it taking so long, so I will have to sing. Well, I wanted to sing, but you see what happened. Anyways, you get the point. So we are pretty much done with setting things up. We do need to go now inside the .cpp file here at the top, right below all of these other includes. We need to include perception, AI perception component and perception AI site config or AI sense config, excuse me. So make sure that you include these two or otherwise it is not going to work. So over here, right below the damage collision is where we are going to call our AI per component or perception component. That's going to be equal to create default sub object of you AI perception component. And we're going to call it here. So in pass a text to give it a name and the name is going to be AI perception component. There you go. Next, we're going to have our site config, which is again going to be equal to create default sub object of type of you AI sense config. So sense config underscore site there you go and over here pass a text parameter and inside of the text parameter we do need to pass the site config name so that we know what it is now we need to configure this site config so that the perception component knows what to do so our site config and from here we're going to say site radius so the radius where the enemy will be able to see the player. It's going to be 1,250 
f so floats and our site config from here loose site radius so where the player needs to go or how far away he needs to go so that the ai perception will lose sight of him well that value is going to be equal to i'm just going to copy this and from here it's going to be equal to 1000 what what i say 1280 also we are going to add to the site so our site config and the peripheral or peripheral you get the point peripheral vision angle degrees that's going to be 90 degrees so the peripheral or I, I don't know how to pronounce it perifer peripheral vision you get the point it's 90 degrees and again site config our detection by affiliation so the tech it's detection by affiliation and we are going to say dot b detect enemies is going to be equal to true our site config so site config and from here detect by affiliation dot b detect friendlies that is also going to be true and last but not least site config and from here detection by affiliation so same thing if it allows me the autocomplete so detection by affiliation dot detect neutrals is also going to be true this is self-explanatory. It is going to allow the site config to detect the enemies, the friendlies, and the neutrals. But since we only have our player, we are going to, you know, detect the player. Next over here, I'm going to say site config, and from here, set max age to be equal to 0.1f. What the hell is the maximum age? Well, age specifies the time by which the stimuli or what has been detected, so the detected actor by this site conflict, when he will be forgotten. So how much time will take for him to be forgotten? Zero means never. So zero means never, and he will never be forgotten. Just like my, you know, girl, your girlfriend, my, never mind, uh, moving forward. So he will never be forgotten if it's zero. 0 0.1, after 0.1 of a second, he will be forgotten, which means then the enemy will go back towards his base location and all of that stuff. Next, we need to call the AI perception component and we need to configure senses or configure the sense. And we are going to pass over here the site config, the one that we have just created over here. Next, I am also going to call AI perception component. So it's actually per comp, there you go. And we are going to set the dominant sense to be the site config and here we're going to get the sense implementation so this is going to be the dominant sense basically the only sense that we have configured which is the sight sense and this is how you set if you have multiple of these maybe you have the hearing sense and so on and so forth this is how you can set set the dominant one so is it sight here or whatever over here i am going to say ai perception component on perception update it and for that i'm going to say add dynamic so dynamic and from here we're going to say this passing here and and we are going to attach this function on sensed and this is how we are binding our function to be informed from the ai perception component when something has been detected over here we are going to say current velocity by default is going to be equal to f vector colon colon zero vector this is by default so when we start the velocity by default is zero movement speed so over here movement speed is going to be equal to 375.0 f and the distance squared is going to be equal to big number we're going to see for what we are going to use this and the big number expands to it's it's a big number so it's just a big number and it expands to you know 
as I said, to, to a big number, but we are going to use this to detect or to test for the distance between the enemy and the player. We will see that, don't worry, that will come over here inside of our begin play. We are going to say base location is going to be equal to this and get the actor, so get actor location. Now, I'm going to control shift B just to make sure that we didn't do any oopsies and yada 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 and all of this stuff because we still cannot and we have something Okay, I type visibile anywhere. Which line of code is that? So shoot enemy line 40. Okay, let's go over here. Let's go over here. Where did I type that out? It's visibile. It's not like this. Visible over here. Visible anywhere. There you go. Visible anywhere. Visible, visible. I, I don't know how to spell. So, you know. Don't judge me. Anyways, control shift B just to make sure that we didn't do any oopsies. We are going to call it a stop for this video because there is a few more things that we need to code before we can actually test this out. And I don't want to make the videos overwhelming. Overwhelming. Some videos need to be large, but those that don't have to, we have everything prepared. Next, inside of our tick functionality, we are going to we are going to create the functionality to move back to our base inside of our sensed. We are also going to detect if we collide with something and so on and so forth and set the new rotation, all of that stuff. If something was not clear what we did so far when it comes to the AI perception component and the side config, just make sure that you ask in the comment down below and I will see you guys in the next video. Moving forward with our enemy AI system, we are going to code this function called set new rotation because all other ones, the unsensed and here what we are going to put in the tick depend on it. So over here, I am going to create a new F vector and I'm going to call this one new direction. And I am going to calculate that by taking the target position and subtracting from it the current position, which are these two parameters that we have. So simply subtracting this from this. So this is going to give us the new direction where we need to face. And I am also going to take the new direction and set the Z axis of it to be 0.0F because again, we care about the X and the Y. And next I'm going to take the enemy rotation and set that to be equal to new direction rotation. So now we have the rotation from the new direction that we have calculated by passing the target position and the current position. So now we can safely call set actor rotation passing the enemy rotation. And this is going to rotate our this is going to rotate our actor. So over here inside of our unsensed what is going to happen? Well, we're going to loop through this updated actors array and we are going to see if we have any info or if something has been detected. So we're going to say for int i, which is equal to zero, as long as i is less than the updated actors dot count, or actually, excuse me, num, I'm used, so used to unity count and length and stun and so forth. So yeah, you get the point. So over here for int i, which is equal to zero, as long as i is less than the updated actor's number, which is, well, this bad boy over here. And this array will contain information about every actor that's, that's been sensed by the AI perception component. That will be it. Now over here, we are going to create F actor perception blueprint info, and I'm simply going to call it info. Now this parameter, this parameter is going to get information about the sensed actor. So whoever we have sensed inside of our AI perception component, this actor, or, or excuse me, this, this parameter is going to get that information. So from here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to say AI perception component, so AI per comp. And from here, I'm going to say get actors perception. There you go. And we need to pass here updated actors and the element that's at the I index and passing here the info. There you go. So this retrieves whatever has been sensed by the given, whatever has been sensed about the, the given actor. So over here, we are looping through the updated actors and every actor that we have sensed 
this will return information inside of this info. So it will return the information about that actor that, that has been sensed. In our case, we are using the site. So if we have seen, I almost, almost want to say saw, seen, saw, I don't know. If we saw, yeah, saw it's more natural. So if we saw that actor, we will have information about him inside of this info, info parameter. So over here, we can say if info dot last sensed stimuli, and this is the last sensed actor and the element that's at index zero. So the one that we have sensed was successfully sensed. So if that is the case, then we're going to do one thing else. If he was not successfully sensed, we're going to do another thing. So again, going over here, if he was successfully sensed, we are going to say f vector, and I'm going to call it dir, not dur, but direction, and that's going to be equal to updated actors, and the element that's at i index, and from here we're going to say get actor location, and we're going to subtract from it get actor location, which is our own location. And of course, the IR, it's not vector. Why vector every single time? And we're going to say dot Z is going to be equal to 0 0.0 F. And what are we doing here? So if we successfully sensed the last simile, so basically the last actor inside of this information, basically the actor that we are trying to get from here. So if we have successfully sensed him, in our case, if we seen him, then we are going to get his location and we are going to subtract from it the current location of the enemy, which is going to give us the direction. So next we are going to take the current velocity and we are going to set that to be equal to direction get safe normal and we're going to multiply that with the movement speed what this get safe normal is going to do it's going checking if it's it's basically going to get the length of this vector but at the same time checking if it's safe to do so based on the length of that vector so essentially getting this direction and multiplying that with the movement speed so the direction is where should we face basically so way where should we face and let me just get my drawing tool there you go i have it now so if the enemy is here and it senses us over here this direction over here is going to have a vector that's pointing towards us like that. So when we say the current velocity is equal to the direction multiplied with the movement speed, it's going to make sure that that velocity is facing that direction and it's going to propel it towards it by multiplying it with the movement speed. And now over here we can call set new rotation and we can pass over here updated, updated actors and the element that's at index and we can get the actor location not actor label actor location and we can pass our own get actor location again not label but location and there you go. So this is going to set the new, this is going to set the new rotation based on the, and again, over here, you will see that it is going to rotate the actor by getting the target position, which in this case is the sensed actor. So the one that we saw with the AI perception and getting our own current position over here, subtracting these two, it's going to get the new direction. And then from there, it is going to rotate our enemy. So this is what it is doing. Else over here, if we don't, have any info about the that we successfully sensed an actor so what we are going to do over here is we are going to say f vector that i'm going to call direction is equal to base location subtracting from it the get actor location so get actor location there you go so if we didn't sense an actor, meaning we didn't see the player, we are going to go back to the base location. And in order for us to do that, again, we need to set the Z to be equal to zero and we're getting the base or the direction, subtracting from the base location, the current direction or the current location, excuse me, from the enemy. And over here, I'm going to test if the direction dot size squared 2D, if that value and open close parentheses, if it's greater than 1.0F, so essentially what I'm doing here, this will get the squared length of this vector. Basically, that is the meaning. So it will get the length, gets the squared distance between two points. 
So that is what, what does that mean? So it is going to get this squared length. And if that value is greater than 1.0, then I'm going to say current velocity is going to be equal to DRI, so direction, get safe normal. So again, I'm going to get the safe normal multiplied with the move speed. And then I'm going to say back to base location to be equal to true. And from here, set new rotation, passing here the base location, passing get the actor location like that. And this over here needs to have equals. So set equals to true. That means that we are now going to go back to the base location because we didn't sense any new actor. And the base location, we get its location over here. So the base location is the initial position where Dynami is. And over here inside of our tick functionality, basically the update function, we are going to check if our current velocity is not zero so is zero like that notice the exclamation mark that we have so we are testing if it's not equal to zero if that is the case we are moving and over here we're going to say new location is equal to get actor location so location and from that we are going to add to it the current velocity multiplied with delta time so this is going to be the new location, our own location of the enemy, plus the current velocity by which we are going to move multiplied with the delta time. If we should go to base location, so if back to back to base location, meaning we should go back to the base location. If that is the case, we are going to first test if inside of parentheses, if the new location minus the base location dot size squared. So again, we're getting the size squared. If that is less than the distance squared, if that is the case, we're going to say distance squared is going to be equal to new location, subtracting from it the base location dot size squared. There you go. So this is going to set the distance squared to this and it's size squared with open close parentheses. There you go. Actually, do I need to? Yeah, only only one. There you go. Else if it's not else if it's not and let me just go here. There you go. If it's not, then we're going to say current velocity is going to be equal to F vector colon colon zero vector. And then we're going to say distance squared is equal to a big number again, setting it to the big number and back to base location is going to be equal to false. And over here, we're also going to set the new rotation to the get actor forward vector. And over here, we're going to say get actor location. So this is going to set the new rotation outside of all of this. So within this if statement over here, we're simply going to say set actor location and passing here the new location. And there you go. So this is going to move us back to the base location. And basically this right here is going to move us to the current location that we are calculating. And we are calculating that, well, with this over here. So if the new rotation, as you can see all of this here, as long as we're following the player, the current velocity is going to be this value. And as long as we need to go back to the current location, the current velocity is going to be this value. So over here, essentially what we are testing, if our new location, minus from the base location if we are going back of course so if we should go back to base location subtracting from the new location and testing if the size squared is less than the distance squared then we're going to set the distance squared to this value otherwise we are waiting until else over here so until this value is less than this value then we are or actually until it's greater than this value that means we have reached the we have reached our new location, which in this case is the base location, because this all happens inside of the, this all happens over here in the if statement, if we are going back to the base location. 
because we need to make sure that we reached the base location so that eventually our current velocity will get to zero because if it doesn't get to zero, we will run forever. Only if we are chasing the player, we are going to run forever towards the player, trying to get him and stuff like that. But if this is our base location, we chase the player up to here, we need to go back here and this is where we need to stop. And this is how we are going to calculate. So if the new location minus the base location size squared is less than the distance squared, then we are going to set the distance squared to the new location minus base location size squared up until the value where this right here is going to be greater than the distance squared, meaning not lower, but it's going to be greater. And then we are going to set the current velocity to zero. Again, set the distance squared to big number. That's why we need it to be a big number because when we start to go back, then every single time this is going to, for the first initial check, this is going to be less than the distance squared. And back to base location is false, and over here we're going to rotate. So control shift B just to make sure that we didn't do any oopsies and everything, you know, compiles and it is how it needs to be. So build has succeeded, as you can see. Now we can go and we can test it out. So if I open my Unity editor, we will be able to, if I hit the play button, where is the enemy? Here he is. If I get close to him and he sees me, there we go. So he now, he saw me and he's rotating to where I am. If I go away and run away from his sight and he cannot see me anymore, then he is not going to follow me. But you know, since there you go. And we finally run away from him. And there we go, he goes back to his base location. Again, if we come over here, his perception is 90 degrees, so he can see us and you saw what happened. So this is his base location. If I run away, look at that. So now he's going back to his base location. So essentially, this is how it works. Just imagine that he has some invisible web over here and he can see everything in this line. And basically how I know that is over here, we have determined that. So his sight radius up to which where he can see is 1,250. The loose sight radius, that is the radius where we need to run away so that the AI perception component doesn't see us, is 1,280. And the peripheral vision is 90 degrees, which means, and you saw that, that the enemy can even see us if we get over here. So if we get to him like this, he can still see us because he can see 90 degrees. That means, you know, he can see here, and here as well. So that is what we have set up. And over here, well, we attach that science config, we explain all of that. Essentially what's happening or where we are detecting all that, it's right here. So if we sensed the player, which just happened, then we're going to get the direction based on his location and our current location. And then we're going to set the current velocity to that value you get the point. If something is not clear when it comes to this video, make sure that you ask in the comment down below. And also, by the way, I've explained this here when we are going back to the base location, when we, you know, lose sight. So yeah, that happens over here as well. So when we don't or we cannot sense anything, we set here back to base location to over here. And then we start running back, which I already explained. But if something is not clear, make sure to ask in the comment down below and I will help you out and I will see you guys in the next video. What is cracking people? So now we have the enemy who has the sight perception or basically he can see. He is a bat that can see. We are doomed, just kidding. But now we are going to animate him because if you remember it, when we got close to him, so let me just get here. Look at that. He is like a you know silver surfer. He is sliding on the ground, which is not something that we want. So we are going to go here inside of the meshes and actually not in the enemy animations and enemy animation. Here it is. If you remember, we have over here the speed value that is set over here on the blend space for the vampire idol running. Now, where can we set that? Well, we need to set that over here inside of our event graph. And that's going to happen over here at the top. I am going to get the initialize. So this is the one that I want. Blueprint or event blueprint initialize animation. First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this try get pawn owner. And from here, I'm going to cast to BP enemy. And there you go. And who am I casting? Well, I'm going to cast over here the try to get pawn owner. If I hover over, 
this function does what the name says. It is going to try and get the owner of this of this pawn, basically getting the owner of this animation. There we go. And who is owning this animation? Well, the BP enemy. We're casting him to the BP enemy. So from here, what I can do is I can promote this into a variable. And over here as BP enemy, simply I'm going to say BP enemy. So again, I need to go here, remove this as BP enemy. So remove that part. And over here, BP enemy REF. So REF is short for reference. So next, what we are going to do? Well, from here, we're going to get our BP enemy. And this is going to happen here in the update animation. So what I'm going to do here is I am going to get the current velocity. Look at that. And it's right here under movement. Look at this over here. So under movement, we have something called get current velocity. What is this? If you remember, I'm quickly going to go back over here inside of the enemy.h, the current velocity, look at this, we set or created a property called current velocity, we set it to be blueprint read only, so we can read it into the blueprint we just see, and we set the category to be movement. This is what it means when you set the category over here in the code. So when you're searching it inside of the blueprint, so from here, current velocity, look at that, it's under movement which we set inside of the code. So now we can, from the current velocity, we can get the vector, so vector length, here it is. And now that we have the vector length, we can set the speed. So from here, I can set the speed, this goes over here, voila, there you go. And this should be plugged in over here. So I need to compile and save that. And now when the enemy starts moving, because in the code, we already know that the current velocity, which is over here, we're changing that value, as you can see. So if we have the player in sight, we're setting the current velocity to the direction, get save normal multiplied with the movement speed that we already explained over here. If we don't have the player, we are setting the current velocity to the safe normal of the direction that we have over here multiplied with the movement speed. Which means now if I go over here, again, compile and save, make sure that it is compiled and saved. So if I hit the play button right now and the enemy sees me and he starts running, look at that, he is being animated and he is running towards me. If he goes back, you're going to notice right now, if he loses the sight of me, he goes back and look at the funny, the funny walk. <laughs> Anyways, you get the point and you saw how now the enemy is being animated. If you have any questions in regards to this and how we can access our variables inside of the blueprint and how, what does the category mean? I mean, again, if how to use it and stuff like that just ask but we saw a really cool example so blueprint read only will make the you know velocity current velocity or any other variable accessible inside of the blueprint category is where we can find it inside of the blueprint and that would be pretty much it i will see you guys in the next video Moving forward, now that we have animated the enemy, the enemy can move, let us make the enemy attack the player and vice versa. The player will be able to attack the enemy. So over here inside of our monster shooter character dot H, right here below our spawn location, we're going to create a U property and this is going to be edit anywhere and this is going to be blue print read only because we will be or we will need to get a reference to this value in the blueprint, we will see later why. So over here we have a float health that is going to be equal to 100.0f and last but not least we have a public function that is going to allow us to, you know, receive damage. So void deal damage and it is going to be float damage amount. Same as what we did with our enemy. So I'm going to right click on this one and I'm going to create the definition inside of the .cpp file but waiting for the, you see, so I'm singing. I wanted to charge you five bucks for that, okay? So here we are inside of our deal damage. And what's gonna happen over here is that we are simply going to subtract from the health, the damage amount that we have over here. So this one over here. So we're simply going to say health minus equals the damage amount. And the health is the value that we, you know, just added over here. There you go, this one over here. So we are subtracting from it the damage amount. And I'm also going to test over here if our health 
So if our health is less than or equal to 0, 0.0 F, that means that the player is basically dead. So what we are going to do is we are going to restart the game when the player dies. So over here, restart game, but we can just for the sake of example, call here destroy. So destroy after that, of course. So after we restart, the, well, first things first, we will simply restart the game when the player dies, but just for the sake of example and testing later on to see if the enemy is actually dealing damage to the player, we can call destroy over here. Now, same thing for the enemy, we need to go and do the same thing. Same thing for the enemy, we need to go do the same thing. So over here at the bottom, we have already defined the deal damage functionality. So we are going to say health minus equals the damage amount. So damage amount that we pass over here. And if you don't remember, we already created here the health and we created here the damage amount. So we're subtracting from it. And if the health gets to the value, so if our health gets to the value that is less than or equal to our, well, zero value, then we are going to call destroy. So it's actually destroy, and there you go. This is going to destroy the enemy. Now, where is this going to happen? Well, first things first, when it comes to the enemy over here inside of our on hit, as you can see, there you go. This is where we are going to detect if we are colliding with the player. And if you don't remember over here in the damage collision, we have already attached that functionality. So essentially what we are going to do over here is we are going to try and cast the other actor. So we're going to say a monster shooter character who is a pointer and we're going to call him char and we're going to try and cast into the a monster shooter character and we are casting the other actor so this is the one who we are trying to cast which is the other actor that we have collided with if that succeeds so if char that means the cast has succeeded we casted the other actor into the monster shooter character that means we collided with the player then from there we can call the deal damage to apply damage to the player passing here the damage value which currently has a value of five so it will take a lot of hits if the player assuming that the player has 100 health it will take a lot of hits to you know deal any damage to or actually to to kill the player but you know it is what it is you can change that value because we set it over here i believe we set it to be edit anywhere so that means we can go inside of the blueprint and just you know edit this value for testing purposes which is really cool and when it comes here for the projectile over here as you can see i've already included the enemy.h but i have commented out because at that point of time where we you know typed out this include the enemy script was not created so now we already have over here the on hit which we have bound over here inside of the collision sphere of the projectile and we're going to do the same thing so we're going to try and cast into the a enemy who is a pointer and i'm going to call him enemy and i'm going to say over here cast into the a enemy so enemy and i'm c casting the other actor and if that succeeds, same as with the player. So if that succeeds, if we do have the enemy, meaning that the projectile has collided with the enemy, then we're going to say enemy. And from here, we're going to say deal damage, passing the damage value that we already set for the projectile. Well, let me see where it is. So where did I set the damage value? Here it is, damage value. So I set it here and to be equal to 20. And of course, after we destroy the enemy, actually after we deal damage to the enemy, we're going to call destroy. So if it allows me, if I can type correctly, you know, so we are going to call destroy to destroy the projectile. So because the projectile, when it touches the enemy, it deals one time damage and then it is destroyed and removed from the game. So control shift B to make sure that this, you know, compiles and it is, you know, error free. And there you go, build has succeeded. So we can go back inside of the editor. And from here, let me just take the enemy 
and let's see over here do we have here it is the damage value just for the testing purposes i'm going to set the damage value to 100 so that it deals damage automatically and kills me so as soon as the enemy touches me we are hopefully going to die there you go and bam you see we're dead we are dead if i go here See, the enemy doesn't exist, actually not the enemy, the enemy has fallen down and we don't care about that because we're going to restart the game when we die, but the important thing is that our player is dead because, you know, the enemy's damage value was 100. So we're going to set it back to 5 because it's not, you know, we cannot play. So let's try to kill the enemy. There you go. And let me just lower my volume. So going back over here, lowering the volume even more to 10, because I don't care about the volume. There you go, one, two, three, hopefully, I think, there you go. There you go. I, I wanted to say, hopefully it will, I will kill him soon. I didn't count how many shots, but since we have the damage value of 20, we need to shot him or shoot him five times in order to kill him. And there you go, you saw that and I can repeat it just for the you know testing purpose. One, two, three, four, and fifth bam and there you go the enemy is dead basic math just subtracting from the health inside of the deal damage so for enemy and for the player just subtracting from the health the damage amount that we pass here when that value gets to zero or lower zero destroy it and that will be pretty much it and over here for the player we are going to restart the game we're not going to kill the player but we will restart the game and we will see how that works and how we're going to you know implement that but at the moment we don't need it Starting from the next video, we're going to create the UI and display visually the health value of the enemy and the player. And from there, we're going to proceed and wrap up our game. If something's not clear, ask down below. I will ignore and just kidding. I will answer and I will help you out and I will see you guys in the next video. Whoa, 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 what it is. Now, moving forward, what we are going to do inside of the blueprints, this is where I'm going to add the ui i'm not going to create separate folders because you know we're only going to have one ui widget so i'm going to right click in user interface and we're going to create a widget blueprint now i'm going to call it bp underscore ui and this is going to hold so i'm going to double click it and this ui is going to hold the player health and it is also going to hold the timer so first things first i'm going to take the text and put it over here which is going to be the timer the anchor is going to be at the bottom middle so the x position is going to be minus two 48, 32 on the Y position, I think. Yeah, that is pretty much it. Size X, 522, size Y, 142, there we go. Over here, I'm simply going to write, not text block, but time, colon, and zero. This is it for now. Now I can, of course, go over here for the font, Roboto, and size is going to be 55. There you go. Is it 55 or 85? Yeah, 85 because 55 is very small. And probably we are also going to align it in the center. And that would be it when it comes to the time. So next, what I'm going to do is take another text and position it here at the bottom. And this text, I am going to set the anchor at the bottom left corner and for this text i'm going to set the position x to 28 position y to negative 181 the size x is going to be 437 and the size y is going to be 73 over here we are going to instead of text block we are going to say player health there you go the font size is going to be 54 and i believe that would be it so next step is to take the progress bar and the progress bar is also going to have the anchor at the bottom left corner. The position X for the progress bar is going to be 28. The position Y is going to be minus 89. I'm going to set the size of the progress bar on the X to 477 and 60 on the Y and that would be it. And over here you can fill it out but for the color I am going to choose, let's go over here something like this red color and I'm going to click OK and there you go that would be pretty much it so safe so now how can we display players health if you remember inside of our player health let me just go over here I set the health value to be blueprint read only which means that we can read it from the blueprint but in order for us to do that we need to get a reference to it so let's quickly go inside of our widget back and over here on the graph 
I'm going to set this event construct. So I'm going to leave that. This I'm going to remove. Tick I'm going to remove. So what I'm going to do here for the event construct, I am going to right click over here and I'm going to get the player character. So this is the one that I want. And from here, I'm going to cast to BP monster shooter character to the blueprint that our character is using. And I'm going to cast the player character, this bad boy over here. So when the cast succeeds from here, I'm going to promote that to a variable, which is going to give me a reference to the player character. So I'm simply going to call this one monster shooter character REF. REF is short for reference. This is my own, you know, naming convention or however, you know, you can call it or whatnot. Anyways, this is how we are going to get the reference of the player. So now that we have the reference of the player, I can click on the progress bar. And over here, we already know that for the percentage, we can click on this bind. So I can bind and I can create the new binding or from here, I can also just try to find the health, but I'm going to do it like this go over here and I am going to call this one display so display player health there you go and for this one what we are going to do is getting the reference of the player character and the next from here I am going to drag a node and I'm going to get the health so here is our health and what I also need to do is divide the health by the float as you can see, and that value is going to be 100 and then plug it in over here. Why am I dividing the health value by 100? Well, it's very simple because over here, the percentage, so the percent value of the slider goes from 0.0, .0 as you can see, up to 1.0. So if the health of the player is, for example, 90 currently so it has 90 we dealt damage or you know we were damaged when we divide 90 by 100 that's 0 0.9 so that means over here if i set it to 0.9 you see this is how the health will be displayed and we can test that out so i'm simply going to put it back to one and compile and save but First things first, I'm going to remove this and remove this. There is one more thing that we need to do. I'm like Steve Jobs, but there is one more thing. We need to go inside of the BP, so our game mode, and inside of our event, begin play, we need to create that widget. So from here, I need to say create widget. Here it is. And the widget that we want to create is the BP UI. And after we create the widget, from here we need to drag a node and we need to add to viewport. So add the widget to the viewport. If we don't do this, then the widget that we have just created, which is this one over here, it will not be displayed in our game at all. So now if I go back over here and hit the play button, we will see, there you go, the widget is being you know displayed. And when the enemy starts chasing me and when he comes close, look at the health value. So health, look at that. So there you go, health value, he dealt damage a little bit. We can probably, there you go, he needs to get too close. So what I'm going to do is go here into the enemy. Since the enemy needs to get too close, I'm going to just move the damage collision just a little bit in front of the enemy. So the enemy doesn't have to get that close to the player to deal damage. Of course, this, this is your own preference. If you want to, you know, move it a little bit further or, you know, put it close, that is up to you. If I hit the play button, let's try it out again. So now what the enemy gets, look at that. So now he's dealing damage and you can see I'm running away and, and he is dealing damage and all of that stuff and yada, yada, yada. Anyways, you get the point. If something is not clear when it comes to this and what we did inside of this blueprint, well, basically over here for our health, make sure that you ask. Otherwise, if you don't have any questions, good for you. You have learned how to create games. Now go, go and create your own Grand Theft Auto. Go my pupil, I cannot wait to see it. And I will see you guys in the next video. Moving forward, now that we are displaying player's health, let us also display the countdown timer. So essentially what's going to happen here is inside of our dot H for the monster shooter game mode, right below the generated body, we're going to have a few variables. One is going to be public and functions as well. So first one is going to be public. This is going to be void restart, so re restart game 
play, which will take a boolean one to determine if we won or if we have lost. We're also going to have a private function and this one is going to be void reset level like that. Next, we are going to have another public and this one is going to be a variable. So it's going to be U property. And this U property is going to be blueprint read only. So we will be able to read it inside of our blueprint and it's going to be our integer timer count. By default, I'm going to set that value to be 300. Below, we are also going to have private variables and this one is going to be F timer handle and I'm going to call this one countdown timer handle and that's going to be equal to f timer handle like that. We're also going to have a void countdown timer function and last but not least we are going to have a public overriding the begin play. So we're going to say void begin play override there you go so these are the functionalities that we have one for restarting the game resetting the level and all of that stuff so what i'm going to do is go here quick actions and refactoring you know that stuff create you know definition and all of that while i'm doing this finally i'm going to take your five dollars i don't know what this is don't give me your five dollars okay just you know quit watching this video and, and unsubscribe from the channel just kidding be subscribed and, and give me your five bucks man anyways here you go so we created everything and if we go over here i'm just going to move the begin play at the top because this is i simply love the begin play to be at the top I know it sounds weird, but you know, that's my favorite pose. Anyways, so include Kismet Gameplay Statics. Over here we have the begin play. I'm quickly going to call the super begin play. There you go. And what's gonna happen over here is that we are going to get the world timer manager. So get world timer, get world timer manager. And from him, we are going to set the timer. And this is going to be the countdown timer handle because we need to use the handle to know which timer we're setting inside of this and what is the function that we want to be called well we want this one over here the countdown timer so over here i'm going to say and sign passing the countdown timer i'm going to call it after one second and i am going to set it to repeat forever after every second so essentially, what is this? Well, this is going to call the world timer manager to set the timer. Basically, this is like a coroutine inside of Unity. And this is how we know which timer handle we have started. So when we want to cancel it, we are going to call this timer handle over here to cancel it. This is the function that I want to be called, which is the countdown timer. Call it after one second and then call it true, meaning forever. So call it forever after every single second. So first call it after one second, then after every single second, and that is going to last forever, ever, 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 ever. And what's gonna happen in the countdown timer? Well, in the countdown timer, we are, and I think I forgot to restart gameplay, I believe. Did I create the definition? I did, but where is it? Begin play, reset level, countdown timer, where is the restart gameplay? Void, for whatever reason, create definition. The operation cannot be complete following the selected text and not contain function, function signature. What? <laughs> we will create it right now. So I'm simply going to copy it and go over here. We have the reset level. And we are also going to have here void a monster shooter game mode colon colon restart gameplay and over here i'm going to say bool one as the parameter for whatever reason i don't know why you saw it was not you know giving me that anyways what's gonna happen in the countdown timer is that we are going to say timer count subtract from that minus minus and if our timer count gets to the point where it is equal to zero then we are going to call the get world timer manager and from here we're going to clear the timer and now we are going to pass the countdown timer handle because he is the one who is responsible essentially he is the one who is responsible for for 
keeping up with the timer handle and canceling the timer handle when there is a need, you know, to cancel it basically. So that's all there is to it. So if you want to cancel the timer handle, you need to have the timer handle that you started, which is our countdown timer handle when we want to cancel it so it will not run anymore, then simply call on the world timer manager, clear timer, and simply countdown timer handle, and there you go. So the name of the handle, and it's going to start or, or stop counting. Next, I'm going to call restart level. So not the game, but restart level. This is the one that I want. There you go. Or reset level, excuse me. I said restart, but reset. Here, the reset level is very simple. We are going to have you game play statics. And from here, we're going to call open level, passing the world and passing the name of the level, which is gameplay. We still didn't create that level. So we will create it very soon and well when that happens we are going to reload that you know gameplay and it's simple as that now just so actually right now i'm going to do it right now i'm going to create it because i don't want to forget about it so over here i can create a new folder for maps and let's go quickly over here file and new level this is the one with the default here is where i'm going to you know add the player and the enemy so i just need to call it gameplay and there you go so from here let me go into the blueprints this is the enemy i don't care this is very small we don't care about that here we have the monster shooter character, the, or actually we don't need the monster shooter character here, we just need the player start, which is going to be over here. Of course, after this, we're going to start creating our level. Don't worry about that. Let me just hit the play button and there you go. This runs, this is just for testing purposes so that you know the code that we have here calling the gameplay, if it doesn't exist, we will have problems and all that stuff. Here, when it comes to restarting the game, we are going to test if we won. So did we win the game? If we, well, win the game, we are simply going to call here reset level, there you go. Else, if we didn't win the game, then we are going to call our F timer handle, then I'm going to call timer handle like that, or restart timer handle, get world timer manager. From here, we're going to set the timer, timer handle and we're going to call it inside of this and this is the function that we are going to call reset level so this one over here so I'm going to copy it add the and sign this is the name of the function and I'm going to call it after three seconds so basically if we won we're going to restart the level immediately if we didn't win we lost so if one is false and we're going to denote that over here so if one is false then we are going to reset the level after three seconds and that is going to be pretty much it now while i am at it over here inside of the monster character cpp let me just see if everything is yes everything is imported here at the top so over here when we die Look at that, so restart game when we die. I'm simply going to get a reference to the game mode and do I have over here my game mode, monster shutter game mode, yes I have. So I have my game mode because inside of the game mode is this function to restart, you know, the, the game. Simple as that. So over here I'm simply going to say a monster shooter game mode and it's a pointer so i'm going to say my game mode and that's going to be equal to from here cast and i'm going to cast a into the a monster shooter game mode and who am i casting from you gameplay statics i am going to get the game mode like that but we also need to pass here the world so get the world and there you go so now we are trying to get the game mode if we do have the game mode. So if my game mode, so we got a reference to the game mode. We are going to simply say my game mode, restart game play that is. So restart gameplay and passing here false. Why passing false? Well, passing false because we died. You see over here, if we get killed, then, you know, we simply need to restart the game. We died and that's pretty much it. So after three seconds, we are going to, you know, restart the game. So let me just compile this. So Control Shift B, we need to compile this.
And the reason why we need to compile it because now going back inside of our blueprints, there you go, everything has succeeded. We are the best coders in the world. So now we can go inside of our gameplay and we can test it out. So we can see right away if the enemy can kill us. So let me just go here for the enemy and set the value 100 for the damage, just so that we can see that the enemy can kill us right away. And when it does, okay, I have shot. When it does, bam. Look at that, it's going to restart the game and voila, there you go. The game has been restarted. If I, you know, you see this, whatever this is. <laughs> well, over here, if we take a look at it, it's trying to get the display health for the player and all of that stuff. We can fix this and we destroy the player. It's trying to access the player to display the health, but we destroy the player. We can fix this by going over here in the player BPUI and before we actually display the health, what we can do is we can break this pin and over here we can test is valid. So it will test if the game object or actually the actor in this case, if it's valid and if that is the case, then we are going to display that health value. Otherwise we will not do that. So this is one of the ways how we can protect ourselves. Basically the character has been destroyed. It's trying to access a character or an actor that has been destroyed. It doesn't have access to a destroyed actor. So that's why we saw that problem. So if we try that right now and if the enemy kills us, there you go, we are dead. The game will restart. There you go. If I, you know, turn it off now, we don't have that problem. That is pretty much it. Now over here for the damage value, I'm going to set that to five back for the enemy. And what we need to do is display the countdown timer because inside of our, you know, if you remember in the game mode over here, we are start starting the countdown, but we need to display that. In order to display it, it's very simple over here in the UI, in the event graph, after we get a reference to the, you know, player, we need to right click over here and we need to say get game mode. And we are going to cast to BP monster shooter game mode. And who are we casting? Well, we are casting the game mode that we got over here. So it returns the current game mode base null if it cannot be retrieved, but if it can retrieve it, it will return it. So we're going to try and cast that one into the monster shooter game mode. And if that succeeds, I'm simply going to promote it into a variable. And from here, I'm simply going to say monster shooter game mode, REF. So this is the monster shooter game mode reference. And over here inside of our designer for the time, I am going to bind over here. So I'm going to create the binding. And this binding, I am going to call display countdown timer or display, yeah, time countdown actually. So time countdown. And what's gonna happen over here is that I am going to get the game mode. So the reference that we have for the game mode, here it is. From the reference, I'm going to get the timer count. So timer count, because we set inside of our class over here that we can get a reference to it. So it is blueprint read only. So now what we can do is I can create here a string. So I can say here append, and this is for the string, not for the array, but for the string. And I'm going to say here time and then colon and then space. And I'm going to append the timer count over here. And all of that I'm going to put over here inside of this returning node for the time. So what this is going to do, it's going to create a string time, then colon, then space. Then it is going to append to it the value of the timer count. And that whole value is going to be put over here inside of that text. So that text is going to be like this time, colon, space, and the value of the timer. And we can simply test that out. If I hit the play button, look at that, 300, 299, 297, so on and so forth, and all of that stuff. When it counts down to zero, I'm not going to wait for five minutes for that, but when it counts down to zero, we are going to die and restart the game and all of that stuff. If something is not clear when it comes to this lecture, make sure that you ask in the comments down below. I don't know what this was. And uh, yeah, I will see you guys. In the next video. What up game dev shooters? So now we are going to create the health UI for the enemy because we have one for the player. Why shouldn't we have one for the enemy? So I'm going to right click, 
user interface and widget blueprint. And this one is going to be BP enemy underscore health. There you go. You can add UI if you want to. I'm not going to add. I'm going to add here a progress bar and I'm going to set his anchor at the center. So I'm also going to set the position of this progress bar. So for the X position, it is going to be minus 650 and the Y actually minus, not plus. It set it on the plus, so minus 650. And over here, the position Y is going to be minus 100 or actually 72. So minus 72. Over here, the size is going to be one two let's say one two 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 there you go or one two two zero <laughs> to one thousand two hundred and twenty there you go over here 136 for the size y i am also going to change here the color to the red color so something like this and let's go over here fill out this fill out the the progress bar. I'm also going to rename the progress bar to, I don't know, health progress bar, something like that. And you need to make sure that this checkbox over here, it's checked. So is variable, this, need, this right here needs to be checked. So make sure, by default it is for the progress bar, but if it's not for whatever reason, make sure that you check it. So now we can go inside of the enemy blueprint and we can go here under add component and we can filter for the widget. And yes, we can also attach these widgets as components on our actors. So this one is going to be the enemy health. So enemy health, there you go and compile and save. And if I go here, we don't see it. I mean, we do, it, it's here, but it's empty. But if I go here in the user interface and widget class, and if I click here to select the widget class and I select the enemy one, there you go. It's right there. So what do we need to do in order, well, to make this work, we need to resize it first, of course. So size or the position Z is going to be 134. The size X is going to be 0.4, actually the scale X 0.4, scale Y 0.5 and scale Z 0.16. So this is going to be the health progress bar for the enemy. Now we need to get a reference to this so that we can use it and display the health value of the enemy when the enemy, you know, is dealt with damage so we can get here now you would think that you can do something like this get the enemy health from here and from here get the progress bar or health progress bar let me just try to find it health progress bar you cannot find it even though over here if you go in the bp enemy health you see that we have the health progress bar so what's the issue well, the issue is that we first need to cast this. So we need to say over here, this enemy health goes here. And from it, we need to get the user widget. So here it is. We need to get the user widget and we need to cast to BP enemy health. So now the widget and this user widget is basically the widget, this one right here, the widget class. So that's the user widget and we're casting that to enemy health and when the cast succeeds we are going to promote it into a variable which is this one right here and we can rename this variable so not as bp enemy health but instead i'm going to say enemy health ui ref so reference to the enemy ui and then from here i am going to get that reference and from there i can get the health progress bar and there you go so now we have the health progress bar and we can set the percentage so set percent and this goes so tick goes here and we're going to check that every single frame to set the percent if we lose any health and we are going to right click over here and get health and if you remember inside of our class, if I go here, we see that we have our health as a U property that is blueprint read, which means the blueprints can read this value. And that is the reason why I can get it over here. But we know that the percentage here goes from 0.0, .0 up to 1.0. So we need to divide this by float and that float value is going to be 100. And then we're going to plug this in. So now we can simply compile and save this. And again, because the 
percentage goes from 0.0, .0 up to 1.0, we need to divide this value by 100. This is in case if the health value goes maximally up to 100, because now if the health is 100 and we divide that by 100, we're going to set the value here for the percent to one. If it's 90, 90 divided by 100 is 0 0.9 and you get the point. So now I can go over here and I can save everything, hit the play button and we are going to see now that we have the enemy, the enemy has the health bar and there you go, you see when we, you know, shoot the enemy, look at that, the health bar is, you know, displaying and there you go and we, you know, kill the enemy. There you go. This is it's this simple to create a health bar in Unreal Engine. Now, for if you don't see the health bar be, like this, we don't see it for a reason. I'm not going to cover that. I covered it, I believe, in one of the previous mini courses. But that is your assignment. Find a way to make sure that this health bar is always rotated towards the player so that we can see it. That is the way how you can see this. So make sure it is rotated towards the player. And that can be easily done by getting the player rotation, calculating, you know, the direction, all of that stuff. Google it, it will be your practice. If something else is not clear in this video, make sure that you ask and I will see you guys in the next one. The before last step is to create a door that is going to serve as, you know, the winning door. So over here, I'm going to right click and create a new C sharp script that C sharp C plus plus. What am I talking about? Inherits from the actor. And over here, we're going to call it door. Very creative. I'm the most creative person in the world. Nobody can top my creativity. And I'm just talking like this because we see that it takes a little bit of time for Unreal Engine to do its thing. So I'm going to sing instead. You owe me 50 bucks for this one. It's not five anymore. I'm not, I'm not singing cheaply anymore. So I, I want 50. My PayPal is in the link down below. Send me 50 bucks for this song. Hopefully this is going to work eventually. So I'm going to probably pause the video over here and wait until this compiled. Thank you, finally. So let's go in the, you know, C in the Visual Studio and here it is, we have our door. So what's going to happen over here below our tick is that we are going to create a few variables. So one is going to be a U property, edit anywhere and this is going to be our class U static mesh component, component and it's a pointer and it's capital S. There you go, it's a pointer, I'm going to call it door mesh that, you know, this is going to represent the door. Also you property, this one is going to be edit anywhere and over here class, you box component, component and this one is going to be the collision component or basically we are when we touch this box then we are going to, you know, detect collision with the player and there you go. And over here we have our on hit. You can just copy and paste this from the player, from the projectile. So over here, just go and copy and paste this. It's the same function. Basically we do this over and over again because that's the only way how we can detect collision between objects or actors. So there you go. So just copy it. And over here, the first thing that we are going to do at the top of the door is import or include all components. So make sure that you include all of these components and then we can continue, pause the video, include these and now inside of here, so inside of the constructor, we are going to create the door mesh. So that's going to be equal to create default sub object of you static mesh component and we are going to give it a name over here with the text. So the text is going to say door mesh or you know whatever you want to call it, our root component is going to be the door mesh. We are also going to set the collision component or create it. So create default sub object. Actually, it's this right here. So create and the sub object is going to be U box component and text over here, give it a name. So the name is going to be collision component. So component, there you go, but just with a space over here. So why not? And over here, I need to add it inside of a parenthesis. Next, I'm going to attach this collision component. So I'm going to say collision component set up attachment and I'm going to attach it on the door mesh. 
there you go. And there is one other thing that we need to do, but it's going to be here in begin play. We are going to take the collision component and on component begin overlap dot add dynamic, not internal dynamic, dynamic like this inside. So this and from there, oh, actually I did not create this. So I need to go here, right click and create the declaration as we just saw and take it from here and add the and sign and there you go. So this is basically everything we need to do. Inside of our on hit, we're simply going to test if we collide with the player. So we're going to test a monster character shooter or shooter character. This is going to be the char. We are going to say if that is equal to casting into the a monster character shooter or monster shooter character casting the other actor. If this succeeds and we have the ch char, char, if we have the, well, char character. So if this succeeds, we have the character. What we are going to do is we're going to get the game mode. So we're going to say a monster shooter game mode, which, you know, is a pointer and I'm going to call it my game mode and I'm going to cast the, so I'm going to say cast into a monster shooter game mode and I'm casting, getting from the gameplay. So gameplay statics, get game mode passing here get the world as the parameter and I need to close the parenthesis one more time. This is not the first time we did this so we are getting the game mode from the gameplay statics and if we have the game mode if my game mode so the cast was successful this worked we're simply going to say my game mode and from here restart game or actually restart game play passing true because we won. So when we win, we are going to pass true over here. We talked about this. We saw this in action, control, shift, B, so that we can make sure that we don't have any oopsies. But these are basic things. So we're just detecting collision with the player. If, you know, we collide with the player, then we are going to simply restart the game. Nothing complicated for this game. Of course, you can add more things if you want to, but that would be it. I have plenty other tutorials where you can see I don't know, whatever you want to add, more components, more logic or whatever. So over here, I'm going to create a new blueprint class that's going to inherit from the door. And I'm going to call it BP door. I know, creative, I cannot be more creative than this. I, I really can't. So for the door mesh over here, just filter for the door. And there you go, SM door. This is the one that we want. And for the door, it's going to stay as is, but I'm going to take the collision component from the door and the collision component, I'm going to set the X at minus 18, Y is minus 48, Z 102. And from there, I'm also going to set here the box extent X to 15. The Y is going to be 45 and the Z is going to be 100. And that's basically it. So compile and save. And we can just take the door now, place it here. And this is where we need to touch. So when we touch here, we should restart the game. And let's test that out. So when I get here, there you go. I've restarted the game and everything works again. There you go. I'm traveling through time, shooting this bad boy. And there you go. Look at that. So yeah, and you see that the timer restarts every single time. Look at that. So now it's at 300 again. And that would be it, of course you can, and I have mini courses for that, published before this one, so you can look that up, and uh, you can add some, you know, sign, you won, congratulations, blah, 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 stuff like that, do you want to play again, again, add buttons, yes, no, and so on and so forth, you get the point. If something was not clear what we did in this video, make sure that you ask, and the last step is to create the level and put this, put this door at the last, you know, part of the level where we need to get after passing all through all of the enemies and stuff like that in order to win. So I will see you in the next video when we create that. 
Now, when it comes to the level design for this particular game, what you can do is take the simple box brush and then position them to form a level. I don't want to stall and gain time on this mini course and this course is five hours or whatnot and creating the level is, you know, last 20, 30 minutes because these are all basic things. What I did is over here in the geometry, I just took this box and then simply, you know, resized it. So if I go over here, first delete this box, if I go here, into the level folder and area one if I take the first floor and I simply deactivate it see it's simple box brush that's resized that's all there is to it this is the first wall that's also a box brush that's resized and it will take a lot of time for you to watch me create all of this and basically what I would do is only change here the locations location here location here change the scale or actually change here the brush settings for X Y and Z that's everything literally everything what I would do and of course attach a material as you can see we have this material and that's all there is to it so you can see we have a hall that we can pass and over here another hall that we can pass and over here you can see the third hall and there you go this is the door where we win the game when we pass the door of course on this whole level you're going to create these enemies I only have one as an example but of course you can duplicate it just hold you know control and then you know duplicate it there is another enemy position this enemy here then position another enemy here maybe you can spice things up by adding here so you can search for a cube maybe add a few cubes here in your level resize them of course just use them as shields to hide from the enemies that can be your assignment or you can download this complete project link will be down below in the description depending on you know where you're watching this so on youtube it's you know in description of the video on my website it's right below the first video i believe so you can download this complete project where you can exactly see the whole position of these box brushes and you can copy this but i highly encourage you to create a level on your own and if you're on my website watching this make sure that you post down below to see for us to see me and the people who are in the course so that we can see the level that you have created because I you know it's not the point of these courses not just for you to copy paste what I'm doing the point is for you to learn so yeah you can do that and I highly encourage that and I didn't want to waste your time by you watching me you know just positioning all of these because you will not learn anything Basically, there is nothing to learn by, you know, watching me positioning these cubes left and right and resizing them and so on and so forth. There is nothing to learn there. So that would be it. Thank you for watching this tutorial series. And I hope that you enjoyed because I enjoy creating these and I will see you in the next tutorial series. Take care.